Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me to give this uh, uh, review talk about the role of ALMA in astrobiology. So I heard that uh, this evening there is a uh, wine, and, uh, well, wine and star session about ALMA and music. Although I do like music and I'm a musician myself, I won't touch about that subject. Um, so first of all, because I think it's a mixed audience, I will present very briefly what ALMA is. Then I'm going to show what ALMA can do in terms of uh, essentially uh, chemistry and also dust grains, and then show you examples from the diffuse interstellar medium up to proto, uh, protoplanetary disks about uh, what ALMA has brought in terms of our understanding of what I would call are the ingredients for astrobiology. It's like you go to the market for cooking, you know what the ingredients are, what, what the outcome of the cooking is, that ALMA cannot answer yet. So. ALMA is an array of 66 antennas located in the north of Chile at high altitude at 5,000 meters and to cover the uh, entire accessible millimeter centimeter wavelength up to one terahertz. Um, the antennas are at 5,000 meters and uh, it, the idea is to be uh, having moving, moving antennas. So going from a compact to a very extended up to 16 kilometers, essentially mimicking a telescope of that size of 16 kilometers diameter. Um, everything is controlled uh, remotely from a site that is below at 3,000 meters. So it's complex operations, and this is a picture I just want to show here. It's the only picture ever taken with an airplane uh, of the ALMA array. Um, so ALMA is uh, probing the, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, not uh, the, uh, so the, the, the millimeter, submillimeter wavelength region, which contrary to the visible, essentially probes what I would call the cold universe. So you don't really see the stars, or you can, but essentially what you see is all the places where the stars are born and made, so the very obscured parts of our galaxy or external galaxies. So what is ALMA measuring? Uh, it first of all measures the dust uh, continuum uh, that are the dark clouds. It also measures because most of the molecules do have their emission lines in that um, uh, spectral region. So it's, uh, it is really one of the fields that created astrochemistry. And basically what you measure is a cloud of dust and gas and I like this little cartoon. You can read the definition here, and you may perhaps also add uh, uh, something about uh, life or astrobiology. So the ALMA status, very briefly, I mean, uh, the construction ended in 2014, and since then and today, ALMA is in steady operations. That means that most of the antennas, the 66, are used for science operations day and night, and very successfully so. Also, as we speak, the observing modes are gradually increasing, and particularly, I would like to mention here, uh, polarization, uh, solar observations, also very large baseline interferometry where you use ALMA in combination with instruments in Hawaii, Mexico, and Europe. So things are pretty uh, stable, are working very well, and I think you have seen, most of you, uh, some of the outstanding results of ALMA from uh, the early universe to our solar system. So this is just a graph that shows you that the uh, evolution uh, from cycle to cycle, so essentially from year to year, from 2012 or 11 uh, to today, and you see that in terms of the number of antenna offered, we are indeed in steady state. Uh, each antenna is equipped uh, with a number of receivers. Uh, today there are eight receivers, which are given here in um, uh, red, and uh, there are two more receivers that are one being uh, uh, currently, uh, oops, uh, currently being uh, uh, developed and study, and the other one is in study, which is band two. When all that will be done, then we will really cover with ALMA the entire range uh, from 35 gigahertz up to about 950 gigahertz in all the atmospheric windows. Uh, the recent band that has been added, and I would like to mention that here because I think it's relevant to this uh, symposium, um, is the band five that covers the range uh, from uh, 163 to 211 gigahertz, so uh, centered at 1.5 millimeter. The reason I mention this is that it's essentially being built to probe a line of water which uh, is being observable from high altitudes because the transition, as you see here, is possible. So you probe um, water directly, HDO and uh, H2-18O, but also a whole series of other molecules. So this band has been offered for the current cycle, and I'm sure that uh, results will come out from this, particularly on proto uh, protoplanetary disks. 
So what is Alma contributing in astrochemistry biology? So first of all, there's a large frequency uh, coverage, so you explore mole molecular complexity. You have high spectral resolution, so you're limiting the line confusion and can identify enhanced species. There's high sensitivity, so you can do unbiased surveys and probing near and far. You have a good calibration, so it's consistent relative line intensities, which is important for the identification. You have a high spatial resolution, so spatial coincidence of line and species and their distribution, which is new, and also the measurement of the continuum emission of dust grains, and particularly because you probe different frequencies, you have a probe of the grain size evolution in objects. So let me first start with the solar system. I will be very brief. Here is a sort of summary of all this topics that have been covered until recently, you see that basically all the bodies of the solar system have been studied, including the sun. But if you can look at the details, you see that also lots of chemistry has been done. I think that ALMA is a fantastic support for even when there are missions going and visit the bodies of our solar system, simply because ALMA is always available. It has a high um, sensitivity, and it also is very quick. So it's perfect for solar uh, body type of uh, observations. I'll give you one example here, which I think is very nice. It's in preparation, but it has to do with Io and the volcanism on Io. And here you see the uh, detection of um, alkali detection on Io here, KCL and NACL, where you see the plummets of the volcanic activity. So that is one example where ALMA can just do observation whenever something is happening, and then follow up and do deep observations in a chemistry. So let me give you a broad picture here about uh, star formation and some of the things that ALMA can do because the audience is broad. So first of all, the formation of star here is a cartoon at time zero. You have a gas of, uh, uh, a cloud of gas and dust like in the cartoon, and then it evolves about in uh, three mega years, or so, a million years or so, into something that flattens, and so you form a disk out of which then later on uh, uh, planets will form and uh, eventually life will appear much later. So this is the uh, broad cartoon of the formation of stars and planets. Um, so um, that takes the collapse takes about uh, yeah uh, th that time here. Um, you have also the uh, dust evolution, and uh, from micro-sized grains up to millimeter, kilometer, and planets. And ALMA is very good to probe the growth of grains from micro size to millimeter. What happens in between the millimeter and the kilometer, I heard from a talk that was given last week, that this is a big question mark, essentially, that is not very well known, and it's an open question. So, Dust is very, very important because on the surface of grains, which are essentially composed of uh, carbonaceous material carbon or silicates, you have a surface which is very cold and upon which atoms can freeze and hence then interact and uh, start chemistry, including very uh, complex chemistry. And it's believed that in the interstellar medium and in, in uh, starless cores, uh, most of the chemistry is really happening on the surface of grains. I mean, they are the very complex chemistry because it's simply very efficient and the conditions, the, in particular the temperature, is very cold. Um, so today in the interstellar medium from the gas phase, uh, we know a lot of molecules. It's about 200. And here is a, I painfully uh, wrote all this. It's based on the Cologne database of all the known molecules in the interstellar medium was here on the top, the number of atoms up to more than 12. Note that there are at, uh, uh, molecules, linear molecules like HC11N, but also uh, uh, like footballine or failurines of C60, C17, C60+. Plus. So it's very complex and it's also, uh, as you may have noted, <coughs> there are organic molecules that have been discovered also in the diffuse interstellar medium. So the picture here, taken from a paper by Aaron Freud, um, is uh, showing you the uh, sort of uh, complex uh, evolutionary cycle of interstellar organic matter. But note that in the interstellar medium, diffuse interstellar medium, we have fullerenes and uh, pHs, which are sort of cyclic uh, uh, carbon uh, molecules, uh, complex ones, although the exact identification is not known. And they have a standing problem in the interstellar medium, which is uh, still uh, open is the so-called diffuse interstellar bands that nobody has 
today been able to identify it, although it's known for more than about 70 years or so. It is supposed that it's due to very complex molecules, but what it is still remains a mystery. So organic molecules in the interstellar medium, there are uh, many, Alma has contributed here, to many uh, interesting aspects. I would like to just uh, mention here a paper by um, uh, Arnaud Beloche, who will talk about it, I think, tomorrow, after tomorrow in greater detail, which is a detection of an isomer of uh, normal propyl cyanide and uh, in the direction of Sagittarius B2 in the center of our galaxy. And uh, it's an isomer version that is about half as abundant as a normal form. And that's very important because, as you may know, branch molecules uh, may rule rather than the exception in the cell medium, but also, more importantly, it's a key characteristic of amino acids. There's also a detection of amino acetonitrile, uh, a potential precursor of glycine in the simplest amino acid, and cyanoacetylene which is a contributor in models of prebiotic, uh, uh, prebiotic molecules and chemistry. All that was done uh, with the 30 meter in Spain with IRAM, but I just mentioned that to um, uh, illustrate the complexity of astrochemistry, even in a diffuse intercellular medium. Another way to probe the uh, diffuse intercellular medium is to look at very strong continuum sources very far away that probe uh, on their way to the Earth uh, galaxies that are external to our galaxy. And then you probe an absorption and you're very sensitive. I just mentioned that here because this is a very powerful tool <coughs> to measure uh, complete spectra and do the survey of what molecules are there. Today with these techniques in this particular source at a redshift of about one, uh, about more than 40 molecules have been detected including species like argon H+. So this is a point again to uh, illustrate the fact that the interstellar medium is complex, whatever the galaxy is, and that there are ways today, particularly with ALMA, to probe uh, external galaxies with very complex chemistry as well. So if you go to a starless core, out of which a star will uh, form, uh, many of the uh, uh, molecules are frozen on the dust grains, but of course you have also molecules in a gas phase. And this is a little cartoon that indicates, in fact, what type of molecules you can identify a measure depending on the depth or the uh, amount of matter that is uh, you, you are probing. And you see there's a whole variety here. And uh, this is illustrated here uh, with uh, data which were not obtained by ALMA, but I think they're very nice. It's paper by Bergen and Tafada, where you see for a dark starless core uh, B68, the continuum, the dust grains, but then the different uh, 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 traces here and molecules where you see that, in fact, they're tracing different parts of, of the starless score. But the bottom line here is that although the chemistry appears to be rich, it's not as rich as you think because most of the complex molecules are frozen on the dust grains and you can't see them in the gas. So this changes whenever the star is born, and then you have a very complex interaction between the radiation of the star and the uh, matter in the dust cloud. Uh, and so you can release part of the uh, ice in, in, into gas and be, and, and be able to, in fact, really probe the very complex molecules that were formed and are surviving the radiation in that type of cloud. And so this is a cartoon explaining this, but I won't enter too much in the details. So let me go into one uh, particular uh, case. So again, this is the same cartoon. So you have ice formed on the surface of the grass grains. It sublimates and injects molecules into the gas phase or enriching it. And then you have ice formed again when you go very close to the star. So it's very complex. So what molecules are formed as material is accreted to the circumstellar disk and how? And how is the rich chemistry of the earlier protostellar stages incorporated into emerging planetary systems? So there again, you have the ingredients, you go to the market, you bring them, and somehow you cook them. The whole process and the details are still poorly known. So let me exemplify that with a recent uh, a series of measurements done with um, ALMA on a source that is in Rho Fucus, which is a little dot here, which is uh, very well known because <coughs> it was a early uh, 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 source for detections of complex organics, including uh, uh, molecules like uh, glycol aldehydes or type of sugar. So this is the image of the source, which is double, uh, taken with ALMA. This is a young uh, uh, star that is forming, and here is about the scale, which is 60 AU. So the uh, PILS survey, which is not beer, but the protostellar interferometric line survey, 
uh, is an unbiased ALMA survey, which goes very deep, which is sensitivity that detects species with abundances about uh, one, thousand, one hundredths relative to methanol. So 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 12 relative to molecular hydrogen. It is a, a survey done at uh, 320, 230 gigahertz. And uh, so I will uh, pre present you the results. So this is the result. That's the full spectral survey. You see it's a full of lines. And the number of lines is about 10,000 separate lines and images for each of the lines, out of which Okay, <clears throat> out of which a few percent are from smaller non-organic molecules, about a third are known saturated organic molecules, and a third is isotopic variants of those organic molecules. So let me go very quickly into the complexity in this starless course where you just evaporate by the uh, UV radiation of the star the uh, molecules formed on the ice grains, and you see that you have a startling amount of uh, complexity. You have acetone, propanol, acetaldehyde, ethylene, oxide, etc. Um, so if you look at the abundances in the different regions here, you have glycol, aldehyde, ethylene, glycol, and you see that the uh, ratios are very different from uh, region to region. And of course, the question here is that either uh, you have an early physical evolution of the sources, or you have initial ice composition, which is at play. Uh, recently, there was a paper published based on these data where there was a discovery of CH3Cl, which was uh, thought to be a biomarker. But interestingly enough here, and also limits on CH3F, but what's really interesting is that the abundance of this molecule is comparable to what is found on the Rosetta uh, uh, comet. And I think we will hear more about that later uh, this week. And so the detections reveal an efficient preplanetary formation of organohalogens, and uh, it questions the whole concept about how good a biomarker that is, and uh, that these cometary impacts may deliver these species to young planets. Um, and uh, so that's an interesting thing. But it's very clear that before these measurements, it was not uh, foreseen that this molecule should have been detected in such a <coughs> young star environment. So astrochemistry, biology with ALMA and the interstellar medium, <coughs> you have an interstellar space where uh, essentially you have water and organics that is dominating, you have more than 200 molecules that are known, out of which uh, you have a lot of organics and very complex organic molecules, such as amino acid nitrile, which is a precursor for glycine, amino acids, glycol aldehyde, a simple sh a form of sugar, and cyanoacetylene. So let me now go to the protostars, uh, where half of the carbon there is still in solid state in the grains, and the rest is mostly in uh, carbon monoxide. You have a rich organic chemistry that is revealed as grain mantles evaporate into the gas phase. So you're probing part of the very complex chemical process on grain surfaces from early phases and during warm-up. Uh, you have a high level of deuterium fractionation, so I didn't really speak about that, that is found, which is important in the evaporated ices, and it's the fossil of coal uh, phase formation. So in other words, you have hints of prebiotic chemistry in protostars, which may be the ingredients that you can bring into whatever planet you may form. So since I just mentioned the word planets, uh, ALMA has had a profound impact on our understanding of protoplanetary disks. This is a pre-ALMA view of uh, which was done with other instruments. It was a, a beautiful result at that time. But essentially what you see here with a few details are blobs. There are contours and blobs that you don't see really any detailed structure. Those are the exact same sources seen a few late, uh, years later in the continuum with ALMA. So what you see here is a diversity of morphology from one source to the other with gaps, rings, etc., even spiral arms. So you have a real uh, a zoology, in fact, of protoplanetary disks. And I remember particularly H.L. Tau, the first time I saw that, I couldn't believe it, because I thought that was a new model that would you know, be superseded with the ALMA data. But no, it was ALMA data, and the models have to, have to be superseded. So how that all is linked with planet formation is still debatable, but I think there is a clear case at least for HL Tau here, if you look at the models, that it's caused by uh, uh, planets that are forming these gaps. And if so, they are uh, lower than Jupiter masses. And you see here in the bottom that uh, these are uh, the model uh, given here. And the model and the ALMA data are very, very comparable. Um, another interesting uh, result is uh, W Hydra, 
<coughs> which is seen here as the HST, it's a scale of 160 AU, here's the diffused emission. And this is the image seen with ALMA uh, here, which uh, I think is beautiful. You see again the rings, etc. This is done with long baselines. And uh, this is the very center. So what you see here is uh, the emission of the grains, uh, tracing millimeter uh, uh, particle sizes. And if you look at the inner image here, you see that there is a dark analysis of about uh, the size of one AU or so from the star that could possibly indicate interaction between the disk and young planets, and that needs uh, further um, uh, studies. So the disk structure that was shown by Nadir in his uh, previous talk here, uh, so I don't want to dwell too much in here in the details, except to say that it is indeed very complicated and many things are happening. You have turbulent uh, uh, transport, but also you have a whole stratification in the disk between what is gas and what is frozen out into ice. And then you have the interaction of the radiation of the star, and all that plays a role. And so there's a whole process there of transformation of the ingredients that you put from the dark cloud into the protoplanetary disk that uh, still requires a lot of study. So let me look uh, now in the gas of the uh, uh, protoplanetary disks. Uh, first of all, uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that uh, in the terms of the distribution of the dust grains, uh, another finding of ALMA, I think, which is uh, really interesting, is that there's a lot of um, uh, um, examples of asymmetrical distribution of the dust grains, the millimeter dust grains. This is an example here. You see that you have more emission on one side than the other of the disk. And um, so that is supposed to, in fact, play a, gr a great role in the formation uh, of planets. And you can think about these uh, asymmetries in terms of the Kuiper Belt object factory. So this is the gas in different objects, uh, different tracers, CO, DCO+, plus, HCN, uh, C2H, uh, et cetera. And you see that, again, there's a huge diversity, but ALMA can do this. Uh, one of the interesting things about what ALMA is doing is the uh, uh, definition and the how to probe, in fact, the snow line, and particularly the CO snow line. And here you have examples of two sources where you see the CO snow line and then the uh, detection of molecules like N2H+, plus, uh, that are probing uh, those zones. There's also the detection of complicated uh, molecules like the cyclic uh, C3H2, which really probes the very inner parts of the disk and with an intriguing structure with Keplerian rotation as well. And so C3H2 could become, in fact, a useful probe of radiation penetration inside the disks. Finally, the <coughs> double DCO plus loops in MIM loopy, <coughs> so it's seen here which is a direct uh, um, a consequence of the complicated chemistry when you go from the uh, different zones, from the uh, uh, icy zones to, to the gas zones. And it's explained here, I don't want to go too much into the details, but indeed what ALMA is able now to do is to probe these disks with high sensitivity in great detail so that you can really see what the different zones are in, in these disks. Uh, finally, the detection of a uh, methyl cyanide uh, in the outer parts of a disk, uh, uh, MWC 480, which the interesting uh, result that the abundance of that molecule is very similar to what you see in comets. So that uh, clearly uh, protoplanetary disks uh, outside of our solar system have about the same sort of uh, physical and chemical condition that the original solar nebula. And let me go to two summary slides. So first, a summary on the protostellar disks and what I would call the chemically habitable zones. So the first thing is how do the ISM and comets organics form? Um, uh, they're formed through uh, a gradual march towards complexity, although the full extent of the complexity in pre phase or comets is still uh, unknown. So then the formation of the disk preserves this ISM materials and there's a further evolution which is driven uh, by the physics, but also the details of the planetary, let's say, architecture or the structure, and that inside a disk. And so it really depends on many things where everything is linked, as we heard in the previous talk. So what is the material that is supplied to forming habitable zones? Can simple monomers can be made in ISM or in the disk and then supplied to planets? That is not known. But it's clearly ALMA is providing essential data as the gas provides information on the ice inside the snow line and also beyond the snow line. 
So concluding remarks and future prospects, first of all, I think that I have convinced you that ALMA provided already basic information on the richness of the chemistry in protostatus cars, enabling detections of new complex organic molecules in the ISM and leading to groundbreaking results, dust and gas in protoplanetary disks. Ongoing and future observations include many things, including mapping of molecular gas emission in disks, uh, probably now with water because the receiver is available. Deeper spectral surveys, deeper than the PILS survey to look for even more complex molecules, which need laboratory data to support it. Surveys to trace evolutionary effects, so many hours spent on a type of objects, but also observing disks around protoplanets may be something that ALMA can do in the future. Now, if you look down into the 10 of 20 next years, ALMA should and will remain one of the main uh, millimeter, semi-millimeter facility uh, operating on Earth. And so, into the many possibilities that have been uh, uh, discussed recently, uh, it's to increase the sensitivity and the efficiency basically by increasing the throughput of the receivers, but also eventually by adding additional antennas to the baseline array. So with that, I thank you all, and uh, ALMA staff in particular, but also your, for your attention.